Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dermot O'Shea, and you're all very welcome to our Irish Gerontological Society Public Forum. This afternoon's IGS public lecture and panel discussion is on reopening Ireland after COVID-19, vaccines, variants, lifestyle behaviours and communities. This, as some of you will know, is part of the IGS public lecture series and a follow on from our public lecture in February, getting Ireland's adults COVID vaccination ready. So welcome back to those of you who are tuning in again. And thank you for those of us that are joining us as a new recruit. Reopening Ireland after COVID-19 is a topic that is occupying and exercising a lot of our thoughts lately and certainly getting plenty of news and media coverage. The focus over the past 12 months has very much been on health and health related issues, but it really needs to be much broader than that. Socialising, communities, businesses and our economy need as much focus, thought and action as public health does. So I hope you leave today's webinar informed, upbeat, uplifted and ready to embrace our reopening Ireland enthusiastically and safely. It might or might not come as a surprise to some of you that as important as stopping smoking, reducing alcohol intake, eating healthily and taking regular exercise is your, in your health, a key ingredient in well-being and ageing is social connection and interactions, the exact opposite of isolation and cocooning. Social connections and interactions, two important ingredients in all of our lives, just like we're doing this afternoon, are among the many casualties of our collective COVID experiences to date a fallout from the social distance and isolation that we've been required to keep to stay safe and well. All of you at this afternoon's talks are joining an interested, growing and supportive collective that are inspiring us at the IGS, along with our sponsors today, Educate for Health, to explore how and what more we can do together with you and for you to arm us with the knowledge to safely and happily get back into the flow of things as Ireland begins to open up again. So with that in mind, we're delighted to be joined by our distinguished panel and speakers and have had such a turnout for today's talks. Thousands of you have registered and many of you have submitted fascinating questions. And in an effort to cover as many of those questions as possible, we're going to emphasise the panel discussion, but also we're trying something new today with Professor Cleon O'Farley from Trinity, who's going to specifically try and answer some of the questions. It's our version of the 60 second quiz, IGS style. So over the course of the talks and panel discussion, we do our best to address most of your questions but apologies in advance if we don't get to your specific question. You'll be pleased to know we're recording this event and it'll be available for you next week on the website. So you can just sit back or walk around with a cup of tea, listen, enjoy, learn and be brought up to date. Today, this IGS public lecture and panel discussion focuses on the challenges and opportunities of reopening Ireland. It will be a collective effort with each of us having our own part to play while taking due caution and continuing to follow the public health guidance. We can certainly express twists and turns in the road ahead, but the vaccination rollout is a huge positive enabler for setting our base camp for the next stage of our emergence. For those of you unaware of the IGS Society, the Irish Gerontological Society was founded in 1951. We're a multidisciplinary society and members of the IGS step from the whole of Ireland. It's a charitable organisation and is one of the oldest societies in the world devoted to the studying of ageing. And among our core purposes, are promoting a better understanding of the general, by the general public of ageing and health related issues, advancing the science and study of ageing, connecting professionals and experts in the field of ageing and promoting education. We do this and more in the pursuit of our vision of an age accommodating and age attuned society, putting the voice of the older person at the centre of policy and decision making for all of us as we age and promoting a society where older people are valued and not left behind. Ireland, like many countries around the world, is in the process of reopening schools, businesses and getting life back up and running at the same time as rolling out this vaccine for COVID. It's taking time, effort, huge organisational skills and commitment from our Paul Reed led HSE, the public health teams, government departments and our communities to do this in a structured, safe, efficient and transparent way. We must all be tolerant of the potential hiccups, blips and turns in the road ahead. They will occur and they will take place. So the focus today is on the panel discussion on how you can play your part in emerging from lockdown and of course how each of us continue to follow the public health guidance. There's little doubt that each of us plays how each of us behaves will influence those around us in the various social bubbles we live in. This in turn will impact how schools, businesses, leisure activities and our lives get back up and running. It's the so-called science of communities. 
All health behaviors play a very important role in helping each of us fight off many and varied infections. And any health behavior which reduces your likelihood of being exposed to any infection is good for your health in general. We now all have a better understanding of the vital importance of the continued adherence to the public health messages. It really is each of us and each of you playing your part. It continues to play a pivotal role in helping us reduce the transmission of the virus, helping us to protect each other, our neighbours, our family, friends and communities and the people we look after. This afternoon you'll hear from two leading national and international figures, renowned public health advocates and experts in their fields about the addition and things we should be doing. Each of our panel members brings you a unique set of experiences and skills and personal insights into what has been truly a year like no other in all our lives and their biographies are on the website to have a look at. So before I introduce you to them, I'm going to hand you over to our esteemed co-chair this afternoon, Peter Lunn. Peter is a behavioural economist and a founder and head of the ESRI's Social and Behavioural Research Unit. He may be well known to you for his very positive and insightful contributions in the media, informing and encouraging us to keep on the straight and narrow. Peter, you really are very welcome to joining us today. And I'm going to hand over to you to pick up and introduce our speakers. Thanks, Peter. Hi, thank you. But, and good afternoon to you all. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon and you won't be hearing a huge amount from me because my job here really is to ask questions and introduce others. And the only thing I would say in response to what I've just heard um, is in so many ways it's been such a remarkable time for us because despite being able to do so little, so much has changed. It's been a time in which people have learned and in which people have changed. And a lot of the focus for me this afternoon is going to be on given that learning and those changes that have happened in our society and what we've learned about ourselves and how we relate to that society how can we go forward and get the better of that have that as being a positive energy for us so that's the kind of questions i'm going to be asking that's what i'm going to be hoping to to hear more of. but we've got a fantastic panel so i'm going to start by introducing our first presenter who is roseanne kenny who is a professor at trinity now i'm not going to give great big biographies for everybody they're all on the website if you'd like to hear them because I'm more interested not in who people are but what they have to say and what they can really tell us and Roseanne can tell us a huge amount. Roseanne is one of the international leading experts in the science of aging and I particularly like her work because of the degree to which it interfaces the medical science and the social science. So I'm greatly looking forward to it and the floor is all yours Roseanne and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Peter and Jeremy. And I'm going to open my presentation now. So friendship, I'm, I'm going to focus today on the science of friendship and social connection because that's what reopening Ireland will mean. And in that context, we'll talk a little bit about how much friendship and social connection contributes to healthy, long lives, longer lifespan. It's important to realize that genes only contribute to 20% of lifespan. 80% of lifespan is due to what's called environmental factors and they are things that we can control and within that context of environmental factors is social engagement or social connection or friendships or interactions. We're going to start the story of social connection and friendship with Rosetta which is a town that lies south of Rome in the Apennine foothills. It's organized around a central chapel or church and a square with narrow stone steps running up the hillside, flanked by closely clustered two-story stone houses and red tiled roofs, a very pretty town. And for centuries, the Rosettans worked in the local marble quarries in the surrounding hills and cultivated fields in the terraced valleys below. But the townsfolk were barely literate and desperately poor. So in 1882, a group of Rosettans set sail for New York and set up a little town near a quarry where they continued to work. They had nothing but good to say about the resources they were drawing in, in terms of finances, contacted others back home in Rosetto, Italy, because they called their new town Rosetto, Pennsylvania. 
and other Italian families followed, such that 12 years later, there were 1,200 Rosettans in Rosetta, USA. Of course, that depleted their old town very much. But they did re-establish their old familiar village in the new land. And they, they started doing this by building two and three story houses on the hillside again and clearing and cultivating the land and planting onions and beans and melons and fruit trees in the long backyards. And we would probably know nothing about this town, which actually was the first indication of the impact that social activity can have on me medicine and health, were it not for this man, a Dr. Stephen Wolfe. He had a summer place near Rosetta in Pennsylvania, and during his summer holidays there, he gave a lecture in Bangor, which is also nearby, um, about epidemiology of health, and at that time, the big killer. So the big killer for men under the age of 50 then was heart disease, heart attacks. They were dying in droves suddenly from myocardial infarction. After his lecture, one of the general practitioners that he'd been speaking to came up to him and said, I am a GP for a number of local towns, including one called Rosetta, and it's considerably different to any of the other local towns because I don't see this high rate of death from myocardial infarction there. People live, I would say, 10 or 12 or maybe 20 years longer than I see anywhere else. Well, of course, this intrigued um, Wolf. So the following summer, he decided to explore this. And he did so by bringing a whole truckload of his medical students with him. And the town folk welcomed them. They opened up the local town hall. The medical students moved in with Wolf and they started doing clinical assessments for all of the things that we know are associated with reduced cardiovascular disease, reduced heart attack, reduced death rates, like blood pressure, like cholesterol, like body mass index, like physical exercise, like smoking habits, like diet, etc., etc. But no matter what they looked at, they didn't actually come up with a conclusion because they were comparing Rosetta with the other local towns which did have high myocardial infarction death rates and they weren't getting any difference between them. And it was one Sunday morning that the solution came to Wolf. He was sitting on a, su a sunny Sunday morning in the square outside the church, flanked by all of these traditional Italian high-rise houses um, when he noticed the Rosettans piling out of mass and stopping and talking for one, two hours afterwards and then setting up lunch in the square because it was a fine day with multiple, many generations engaged in the process of entertaining neighbours, feeding neighbours, chatting, discussing, moving from table to table, house to house. And that's when it occurred to him that the secret of Rosetta is Rosetto itself. Now there's been a lot of research on this since then, um, and but his initial description of how Rosettans visited each other, stopping to chat with each other in Italian on the street, cooked for each other in their backyards, learned about the extended family clans that underlay the town's social structure. He saw how many homes had three generations living under one roof, how much they respected grandparents, and at mass the unifying and calming effect of the church. And remarkably for a town of now 2,000 people, there were 22 separate civic organizations. So they were very, very busy getting together and engaged with their local community. And there was a particular, particularly notable egalitarian ethos in the town that discouraged people from flaunting wealth, should they have it, or success, and helped unsuccessful, obscure failures. Indeed, there were no records of suicide ever in the town and very, very low rates of depression. He wrote a book, The Power of the Clan, and this can be still purchased on Amazon, and wrote his first paper in 1964, and it was pretty much discredited 
by the science and medical community at the time, because how could it possibly be that being but friendship and social engagement and talking to people and connections could have a physical effect on your health and extend your healthy lifespan? How could that be? At the time, genes were coming into their own and everybody was concentrating on the importance of genes. Nobody was listening to this important message from Wolf. But since then, there's been a host of really good science on the value of social relationships and, and death. And this is one study of 140, uh, one study which combines 148 different studies of over 300 thousand people, which shows a 50% increase in the likelihood of survival due to stronger social relationships. The same, as Jim had said in his introduction, as the risk of smoking, alcohol excess, low physical activity and high cholesterol. A massive impact of social, strong social relationships on physical health. And they concluded that the influence of social relationships on the risk of mortality is comparable with other well-established risk factors for mortality. This is pretty remarkable when you look at the contribution that social integration and close relationships makes, the relative contribution to cardiovascular deaths, death from heart attacks or high blood pressure or kidney failure, or stroke. That's where clean air comes in. It's important. This is where high blood pressure treatment comes in. This is fat versus lean. This is exercise, also important. Cardiac rehabilitation after having a heart attack. Flu vaccine, look at where the relative contribution of flu vaccine is to cardiovascular mortality compared to clean air, etc. Stopping alcohol, stopping smoking, huge impact. In fact, most of our research would show that cigarette smoking contributes to 50% of all of the negative health things that we can find in the TILDA longitudinal study. It's huge. But close relationships are this important. And social integration is how frequently you engage with people going down to the shop, talking to somebody, on your way back from the shop, stopping, meeting, speaking, moving on, meeting somebody else, having people pop into your house, into the kitchen, having a chat. Many of the things, unfortunately, which we as a society have dropped as being part of our normal daily activity, these are the things which predominantly influence mortality from heart disease, which is, which is the biggest killer. Look at the impact of social integration, frequency of integration. So that's not about the quality of relationships, it's the frequency of encountering people and engaging with other human beings. And in, in the TILDA study, we've looked at this in depth, and, and one of our outcomes has been that volunteering and participating in your community, looking after grandchildren, is associated with a higher quality of life, less physical comorbidity, that means illnesses, including heart disease, and less depressive symptoms in an Irish population. So it's working for us too in Ireland. Now the blue zones are five uh, zones around the world, uh, in California, Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, and Japan, where people not only live longer than anywhere else, but they live better. A large proportion live to over 100, six times more than on mainland Italy, and 10 times more than in the USA, live to 100 and beyond. And the important thing is that they don't just live to be centenarians, but they live healthily to be centenarians, and as centenarians have good physical and mental health, typically without the same level of chronic diseases that we normally see. And very interestingly, we know that women live six to eight years longer than men in developed countries, but not so in the blue zones. And one of the factors which contributes to the longevity in the blue zones is interaction with their neighbors. They have, the, they, they have what I've just described to you in terms of social engagement. Loved ones come first. 
close and strong family connections with spouses, parents, grandparents, grandchildren. And they part of the right tribe. The world's longest lived people have close friends and strong social networks. Your friends are really important and a sense of belonging. And indeed, faith-based communities, uh, being part of a faith-based community can add up to 14 years to life expectancy. And that's what we see in these, in these blue zones. I love this statistic. Our friends actually share more of our gene, genome than we would randomly expect to be the case. And so do our spouses. There, it, the, the, the sharing is equivalent to what you see with, with respect to four cousins. Now, most of you, most of us don't know our fourth cousins, but our friends and our spouses share that level of commonality in terms of genes. The behaviours with respect to social engagement and, and friendship are, are, are very much part of our hard wiring. And as, as we've evolved, so too does the need for social connection. This is the a baboon called Sylvia um, uh, in Botswana. She was studied by a very famous biologist who reported that Sylvia was a right bee when, when, when she had her daughter, who was her best friend, and she would squabble and, and uh, get into con conflict with all of the other monkeys or baboons in the colony until such a time as she lost her daughter, who was her sole companion and best mate. And then she changed her behaviors. She started offering to groom other baboons and help with their children, etc. Her, her, because she needed social connection and social engagement, being a gregarious animal. Loneliness and social isolation trigger inflammation. That's the answer that the gene, gene, gene specialists at the time of Stephen Wolf's work couldn't get their head around. We know inflammation is one of the most important factors which underpins the aging process. Why our cells age? the pace of aging, accelerated aging. So loneliness and social isolation trigger a chronic inflammation, which is not good for us. Acute inflammation is fine. We need that to counteract infection and other insults to the body. But chronic inflammation is bad for the system. It overstretches and stress, stresses the system and accelerates aging of individual cells. And we also know that loneliness and social isolation trigger stress hormones. And chronic stre stress hormone triggering is also bad for us. And this is the case both in animals and in humans. There's some really nice work around this in macaques, which are uh, important from our perspective in terms of studying human behaviors because they share genome, uh, the macaques genomes share 93% of sequencing with our own genome. And the first research that's been done fairly recently on this that I want to share with you is biopsies of lymph nodes in monkeys who were unfortunately rendered friendless. And the lymph nodes are the, the areas of the, of the neck which swell up when you have an infection or sore throat or you're tired or stressed. They're the engine for inflammation and immune responses in the body. And what do they find when those lymph nodes were and biopsied in friendless monkeys, that there was a high activity of inflammation and a low activity in genes that protect against viruses. And they also found in another study from Harvard that fibrinogen, which is a clotting agent and is also an inflammatory marker, which can is associated with more cardiovascular disease, was much higher in animals, macaques again, which had less social contacts and less quality of relationships. And in recent human studies, we in the TILDA study and in other groups in Trinity and others worldwide have shown again and again that social isolation is linked to higher levels of inflammation, particularly these common potent inflammatory markers. And the stress hormones that it triggers from our work are noradrenaline and adrenaline and cortisol. But it isn't just the physical body that experiences negative consequences of 
poor social connection and lack of friendship. Our brain is constantly throughout our lifespan capable of generating new brain cells, new brain blood vessels and new communication bridges between brain cells. This is a new discovery. We thought we were born with a brain that stayed consistent throughout our lifespan and atrophied and decayed as we get older, but no, our brains do have the capacity to regenerate throughout the lifespan. And social engagement and social connection and friendship and quality of relationship and frequency of interaction actually helps that regeneration of new brain cells, new blood vessels, new communication channels, because it reduces inflammation, which negates these processes, and it reduces noradrenaline, adrenaline, and cortisol, which also, if their levels are high, dampens down our ability of brain cells, etc., to regenerate. And there is emerging evidence to suggest that loneliness and poor social engagement and social isolation is actually a strong risk factor for developing dementia. And, and some of this work has come from uh, pathological studies, post-mortem studies, in people who have the same level of neuropathology for dementia, the same sort of cell changes, looking at them under the microscope, but in this group had great friendship and social interaction and connectivity in life. And this group socially isolated, experienced physical pain and loneliness, according to questionnaires that were done consecutively before the participants died. Despite having the same neuropathology, the group with the social connections didn't display by and large any of the features that we associate with being demented, with dementia. They appeared not to have dementia compared with the other group who clearly did have dementia. So this is a fascinating uh, uh, question. Why is this the case? But for now, the important answer is that, well, at least we know what the association is and we can do something about that in life by modifying environmental factors. And the Irish Longitudinal Study, as you'll be well aware, we're studying eight and a half thousand people over 50 reassessed every two years. And we did have an opportunity to look at loneliness in the study just before the pandemic. So if you're this uh, side of the scale, it's a good thing. And then the more towards the right hand side of the scale, the lonelier you are. But unfortunately, during the pandemic, that whole uh, scale, sorry, shifted. I'm trying to go back. That whole scale shifted to the right and loneliness was two and a half times more common. This is only four months into the pandemic. And we've now got some repeated data to analyze with respect to this. I suspect the levels of loneliness are much worse. And it was, it was higher in people living alone, people with poor physical health and poor mental health. In other words, you know, depression before uh, we went into the uh, lockdown associated with the pandemic. So I guess the question that I would like to hear the panel discuss is how we can restructure our society to enhance social engagement and um, to ensure a higher impact on healthy lifespan and better quality of life. And given the evidence I've shown you, that is the case than for any other single intervention we can implement. And there are so many public health initiatives around blood pressure management, exercise, cholesterol. I'm not saying not do that. Gosh, of course not. I'm saying this is an additional one that we as a society and a public health group should be addressing. Social engagement for long life. And also to make the comment that it isn't just particular to people as we get older, but it's the case throughout the lifespan that we experience loneliness and it's bad for our health in later life. Thank you. Uh, Roseanne, that was brilliant. Um, and to, to be honest, I, I, what really struck me about it was not so much that the effect exists. I think I probably somewhere knew that, 
But the scale of it is one of the things that's quite remarkable looking, looking at your data. And I've got a couple of questions before we move on to the next presenter that I want to ask. And I think something that's likely to have occurred to a lot of people listening to your talk, is there data and evidence that tells us to what extent online social interaction is a good substitute and to what extent is it not? There is evidence in younger age groups that actually uh, engaging in social media can have positive and negative consequences in terms of social engagement. Um, and that's because that platform can be so varied in content than that it isn't always po a positive messaging that's being conveyed through sure. social engagement in, in social media. But we don't have anything, um, uh, there is virtually no literature out there in the context of o older adults and, and social en engagement through so, Zoom or the platforms. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally interested in this. So as someone who's seen my mum once in 13 months, um, but is now talking to her for two hours every week on Zoom, which is probably more than I did before the pandemic, am I better or worse off in terms of the relationship and the social connectedness I'm giving her. I, I have no doubt that it's better off. I have no doubt that it's better off. It's just that the research hasn't been done yet, pre and post, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I have no doubt that that you're better off and that people are much better off. Now, does it compensate for face-to-face -face engagement? That's a really interesting question. We've taken, you know, thousands of years to evolve, and this technology has only come into into our li life uh, awareness in the last twenty. 10, 20 years, for some people in the last year, we've, we've become accustomed to face-to-face -face engagement inter interaction. Um, and I deal quite a bit with technology companies and my message to them always is that technology should complement face-to-face engagement, etc., cetera, not, not uh, replace it. And I think the example of the blue zones where people were coming in and out of the kitchens all of the time, that's, that's a, you know, that's a very varied interaction with other humans. Some of it good, some of it bad. But, but you know, what I'm saying is, you know, there may be characters coming into your kitchen. You think, oh gosh, when, when, when's he going to go? But nonetheless, it's very varied in how we've evolved. I, I do hope when you think, oh, goodness, when's he going to go, you at least still get the benefit. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I want to move on. And just before moving on to the next speaker, I just want to say, I mean, obviously, you threw it open at the end of the presentation as to what yeah. as a society we do about this. But I, I'm just get the ball rolling a little faster for us. I mean, you've worked in this space for a long time. You've got really mm -hmm. strong findings about the scale of these effects. I mean, as individuals and as a broader society, are there concrete things we can really do to take advantage of this research? I would like to think that we could recreate communities around the small areas we live in. And by that, I mean, make it accessible our local shops, you know, rather than going to big centres, etc. Like make parking easy. Allow planning permission for small clusters of the butcher, the baker, the grocery store, etc, etc. That's one thing that we can do. I think awareness there's very little awareness of what I've just described. I think with planning, we can plan now for multi-generational mixed housing that it takes into consideration the need for community spaces. Mm -hmm. I just okay, asked that's that very good. Yeah, okay, so there's a lag phase. During the pandemic, at the back of my sister's house, there was a little way where nobody was using. And five or six of the neighbors got together and started to just you know, make it into an area where the kids could play. And suddenly now it's developed into a garden. They've put seats. They're there nearly every night and, I, and they're not drinking water. And, and, but it's, I was struck by how they created a little community engagement. And this is on in an area that they wouldn't have known their neighbors before particularly well. So that's the sort of initiative we need to, um, really support. Uh, that's great. And I'm sure that's going to give the panel plenty to chew over and they'll be dying to get in on some of those issues. So th that's a great way to start the afternoon. Thanks very much, Rosanne. Much appreciated. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Uh, our next speaker, again, is a professor at Trinity College. Uh, Cleonaro Farrelly is professor of comparative immunology and, importantly, in the current context, the co-chair of the expert advisory group to NEFET, the National Emergency Team. Uh, we're greatly looking forward to you. Um, Cleona, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Peter. Um... Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, the, the first slide first. So, um, quite a different, uh, different approach to this, uh, to what um, Roseanne spoke about, but you'll see that there'll be a link at the end. I'm going to chat to you a little bit about um, the virus itself, um, about what it does to the immune system, about these wonderful antibodies that we, the vaccines are trying to generate that will protect us against infection, um, and um, a little bit about the variants, just to get a conversation going um, where we can um, discuss and ask questions. Um, so this is a beautiful image um, made by a very brilliant uh, PhD student here in Trinity in genetics, Laura Finnegan, um, illustrating uh, what, uh, a kind of, what a virus, what this particular coronavirus looks like, so-called because it has these spike proteins on it, um, and how it uh, gets into our cells that line the nasopharyngeal tract where we breathe in. And um, a really important point to remember is that we have literally trillions of these cells lining our tracks, all of which can get infected by the virus, all of which then will generate the virus. Um, a virus is so tiny, it cannot live on its own. It has to take over the machinery of a, its host cell in order to make itself. And uh, this is exactly what Laura is illustrating here. And what she also illustrates is the importance of hand washing, because what um, detergent does is it removes the lipid layer that um, co coats a virus into which the protein is struck and which is stuck and which holds the, um, the nucleic acid inside in the middle of it. Now, uh, viruses are really, really tiny. And this uh, diagram on the left tries to illustrate it. The big red thing is a red blood cell, which you already know is way smaller than we can see with our naked eye. And um, the huge thing on the right that looks like a planet is, is actually a piece of dust. Um, further along to the left, you can see then um, a viral particle, which is literally thousands of times smaller than and a, a red blood cell. The, the image on the right hand side is of a transmission electron micrograph of part of a cell where you can see multiple, multiple um, viral particles. Those little black roundy things at the edge are little viruses that are all replicating. So um, this is the important, another really important point um, to uh, try and communicate here is, is first of all, how tiny viruses are. And secondly, how powerful once they get into our cells are that they can self-replicate um, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, even millions of times. So how, how can we protect ourselves? Well, first of all, we have our immune system and inside in each of those infected cells, there's actually a multiplicity of defense mechanisms called our innate immune system, which I'm not going to talk about here, but might come up in the questions and answers. Um, but what a vaccine does is it stimulates our adaptive immune system, that is our antibodies and our T cells, which um, have not encountered the virus before, but can make a very specific um, response. And uh, this is illustrated here um, using the, um, the Oxford vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine as an example. And what they do is they put a tiny bit of nucleic acid onto a totally, into a totally harmless um, virus. And that little bit of nucleic acid um, codes for the spike protein, the bit that makes the, um, the coronavirus look like a crown. Only a tiny bit of that protein is coded for by this nucleic acid. The harmless virus, when it's injected into us, carries this nucleic acid into our cells. And now our, ce our own cells make this tiny little bit of a viral protein. And that little bit of the viral protein is what stimulates the adaptive immune response to make specific T cells and specific antibodies against that tiny little bit of the protein. 
But because this protein is um, so important, because this protein is, is so powerful and it is actually what Laura calls in her, um, in her diagram, the key for getting into our cells, if we have antibodies against that protein, viruses can't get into our cells. So um, you may well ask, what's the difference between the various vaccines. On the left hand side is the AstraZeneca Oxford one, which uses a viral vector, that's the harmless vector, to bring in the bit of nucleic acid into our cells. Um, second um, from the left is, the, is an, a typical RNA vaccine where just the nucleic acid, the RNA itself, is directly injected into us. And that is um, the Moderna and the Pfizer one. And once that nucleic acid gets in, it stimulates um, our own cells to make that tiny little bit of viral protein. Um, uh, several, vaccine, several companies have also um, made vaccines using inactivated whole virus. And we might get a chance to talk about why that might be a, an advantage. While others um, make, uh, this is the one on the right, other companies make the protein itself or make the little fragment of protein um, that can be injected in and stimulate the immune response. So, so these, um, these vaccines are illustrated uh, here, are summarized here, the RNA vaccine. Um, produced by Pfizer and Moderna, as you know, requires two injections and it also requires very specialized um, facilities for, for storing it. So uh, rather challenging to deliver. The viral vector ones produced by Oxford, the Sputnik, the one from Russia that you might have heard of, which also sounds really good, um, uh, and the J&J &J are based um, on the viral vector sorry, the top ones are the RNA ones, and they're a little bit easier to, to um, uh, prepare and to um, deliver. And then uh, the inactivated virus, this is third down, um, uh, is, for example, the one of the Chinese ones, one of the Chinese companies is using, which again has got good data, the Sinovac um, and the Sinopharm, two of the Chinese ones, and Covaxin, um, which is from the um, uh, Arab Emirates. And then um, there's a, a couple of quite a few protein ones in, in development, but in particular, what you'll hear about is the Novax. Most of these, um, the schedules um, being given permission for require two injections. But in fact, the data is coming out very strongly to show that one injection actually gives very good protection. So what, do, what, what does the vaccine do? It stimulates, as I said, an adaptive immune response, uh, T lymphocytes killer T lymphocytes, which will kill infected cells. But the, the, the products that you probably are most familiar with are these antibodies. These are soluble proteins made completely de novo in our bodies in response to the vaccine. We can measure them in the serum very easily, though probably the ones that are most important are ones that are secreted in our nose and our mucosal tracts, which we're not measuring yet, only in research um, facilities are we measuring these. Um, otherwise, the ones in the serum are relatively easy to detect and measure. But as I said, they're stimulated by the vaccine and in some cases can last a long time. Now, this is very important information that we're looking for is how long does an antibody response last and how protective is it? And this diagram in the, in the center illustrates how um, a, a specific antibody binds to the spike protein on the virus, um, which I neglected to say is actually called SARS-CoV-2. Um, COVID-19 is the term that we use to describe um, the infection. The virus itself is called, because it's a coronavirus, and one was already discovered, so that was, was the one. And here you can see the, um, the spike protein nicely illustrated here, and the antibody binding to it, so that you obviously need antibodies antibodies to bind to all the spike proteins on a virus so that it can't um, it attach to a human cell. And um, as you now are aware, we can have millions of viral particles. So you need a lot of antibodies to be able to um, stop the viral particles from um, reproducing and from binding. Now, um, many people are hearing a lot about the viral variants that are appearing. And I think with this little bit of background, you now know that viruses replicate really rapidly. They're produced in large numbers. 
Um, a, and um, a, a, an important point is that viruses don't always replicate the term we use completely faithfully. They, they don't replicate the nucleic acid really perfectly. So there's always a possibility that um, a, a slight variant, a, a slight a, a coronavirus that is slightly different to its parent can emerge. And so they do, variants arise frequently due to this, this, this lack of, of perfect replication. And where do they arise frequently? Particularly in places where um, the, the virus is allowed to um, multiply without any control. So particularly in countries where are places where there's no quarantines, where there's no control of the virus, where there's no vaccines. Um, at the moment in Ireland, sh Ireland should not be a Petri dish for variants to appear, but because of our um, limited quarantine system, we're absolutely vulnerable to variants coming from other places. And here's the cr critical thing. If the variance is in the spike protein, then uh, the antibody that the antibodies that are made to the vaccines that I've to many of the vaccines that I've described, it's possible that they may no longer work and that we'll need to generate uh, another vaccine. So what should we do in face of all of this? <laughs> well, first of all, if we, we all must get vaccinated. So to try, we, first of all, yes, we have to uh, do the things we are doing to try and slow down the virus, try and contain it, try and get control over it. And um, really important in getting control over the virus um, is the vaccine. So as many of us as possible um, should try and get vaccinated. But how? But because of the possibility that not everyone will be protected and not everyone might be protected against um, all the variants that will be generated across the globe over the next um, year, two years, we need to be prepared to be vaccinated again when um, more vaccines become available and as we understand more. And another very important point, we absolutely must help other countries get access to vaccines. Um, and we can again discuss this a little bit more um, uh, in, in the discussion afterwards uh, as questions come in. And then just to follow on from um, what Rose Ann was talking about, we must use everything in our power to try and keep as healthy as possible so that our own immune systems can be as effective as possible if we encounter this virus or any other virus. Thank you. Okay, Kleena, an absolute, really fantastic talk. Thank you so much, a real tour de force. And I guess when you look at what you've just said and what Rosanna said, um, not to slack off or get complacent about the hand washing you've really emphasized there, but we've had floods of questions in around three themes, I think is the best way I could do it, um, around safe vaccines, the need for boosters, uh, and indeed AstraZeneca on its own. So I thought we might go through a lot of some of the questions and see, you know, like mastermind, you can pass if you don't want to answer it. We can always get someone else to answer it. But, um, first of all, there's a group of questions coming in from people around uh, how long does immunity last? Uh, do, uh, can reinfection happen? Uh, and do I need to get more than one vaccine shot? So I've grouped those together as a summary of a number of them. Great. So well, all great questions. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman. All great questions. And now the one about how long does immunity last? Goodness me, if only us immunologists could answer that. I mean, we, we all think and we know the evidence absolutely is there that um, our single polio vaccine is, is, is like magic. It does last far up to a lifetime. But we absolutely don't know that for every single vaccine. And we certainly don't know it for these new ones yet. The evidence is good that an antibody response can remain strong. At the moment, we have data uh, from um, nine months, I think, of uh, a post-vaccination, and um, an antibody response can be detected. Um, but complete, we, the questions we don't know the answers to is, is whether those cytotoxic T cells are still there nine months later or will be there next year or two years later. So, so it's, uh, uh, as I say, a, a whole sequence of, of or a whole range of unknowns there. 
Yeah, both you, thanks for that. Both you and Roseanne mentioned flu, and there was a couple of questions in around the flu vaccine. So asking, will this replace the flu vaccine? And will I just be getting a COVID vaccine? And like the flu vaccine, which people get annually, should you be getting a COVID vaccine annually or more often? Oh, gosh. Um, Jeremy, do you bring up a really good point here because people are um, noticing that there's a real decrease in incidence of flu at the moment because we're all being so self-isolated and looking after one another. But that's because the flu virus itself is not able to circulate. I mean, as soon as we're all back out li living our normal lives again, um, flu will be around. And unless we get the vaccine, a, a, a flu vaccine, we won't be protected against flu. So, no, you, uh, you, you will need both a vaccine against flu and the vaccine against coronavirus. But to come back to, to the second part of your question, which is, um, will we need um, another uh, another coronavirus vaccine, like we need a yearly uh, flu vaccine, that's uh, certainly for as long as there, uh, the virus is, is swirling around the globe. There's more than likely to be constantly be a constant stream of variants emerging. And um, I think most immunologists anticipate, yes, that we will need to be vaccinated at a, a regularly like we are with the flu. Okay, now that picks up on a number of areas that are coming in question-wise. I'm just looking at them here. And I'm a bit uncomfortable with the stigma around the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, the whatever variant. So I don't know what yes. the right names for the variants are. But the, the questions are sort of specifically saying, is the vaccine good just against a particular COVID only? Or do we have to be concerned about other variants or not? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I was trying to explain about um, variability. And I agree with you completely about calling it this, you know, we shouldn't be calling it the Indian, the Brazilian. It's, it's, it's a shorthand because that's where it was first described. Um, but uh, any, any country, anywhere where the virus is growing, can produce a variant. Um, and um, they're given different names to, as to whether they're uh, important or not to our health. If, if there's a change in, in a part of the, the virus that um, doesn't matter to us at all, then the variant itself doesn't matter. But some of the variants make the, the virus, the coronavirus, um, more infectious. And that's one of the variants that has entered into our country is one that is apparently is more infectious. And we don't know yet um, how effective um, the, the individual vaccines are against that particular variant. So this is also why I was mentioning the different types of vaccines. It may emerge that um, one of the vaccines that's against um, an attenuated virus using the whole virus as, as a vaccine may actually turn out to be better um, than one that is just against the spike protein. Okay, that's really interesting. Can I, know, there's a lot, I don't know how to summarise these, but there's a lot of questions coming in, which I think I'd summarise by saying is how much immunity is enough? Now, I don't be able to tell who's answering uh, asking these questions, but, but I think yeah. what they're trying to get at is if, if I've had one dose of vaccine A, yes. do yes. I absolutely need the second? I think this, do I absolutely need the second dose or would I be better getting a second dose of another vaccine? But I think yes. if to pick up that team, how much immunity yeah. is enough? Yeah, well, this is back again to which immunity? <laughs> which immunity is actually, and that we don't know yet, which is the best, um, which is the most, first of all, no, I should answer simply, that um, there's a lot of evidence coming out that one injection is very protective. That's as much, you can't guarantee and say that once you have one injection of any of them, you are definitely not going to get COVID infection because there's such variability in terms of how each person um, responds to the vaccine. But um, whether, so it is, one is very protective. A second injection, if that's part of the regime, will improve that protection. But whether that will provide protection against the variants is unknown. But your, what your, what your um, question or what the audience is actually asking about, and again, uh, Kingston Mills and myself literally this morning had a conversation about this on the corridor. Um, are we, would we be better off waiting, taking one injection and then waiting for another one, uh, another vaccine to come down the line? I think that um, we need to be prepared 
yes, we need to be prepared to be able to, uh, or to receive other vaccines as we hear whether um, they are, are more protective or not. But I would okay. certainly now, would not be turning down any, if you know what I mean. Okay. Now, when we're getting Peter to come back in, I might ask you one more yeah. question, because uh, the other yeah. panel members get really cross if we monopolise this. Okay. Uh, and we come back after they've had their turn and Peter's involved, all of us. Um, but uh, the question that I'm going to finish with you at the moment is, uh, in terms of people who have no symptoms, but still yes. are purported to be able to spread the virus, yes. versus yes. people who are, inverted commas, super spreaders. So yes. one of the questions that came in was, well, what is a super spreader? And yes. secondly, uh, can, you, can you find them? And thirdly, <gasps> is it possible to spread it when you have no symptoms? And is that yes. why the public health message is so important? And maybe Peter yes. would like to yes. come in on stage and he may have something else he wants to ask as a follow-up. Uh, again, these are really, really important questions, Jeremy. And um, absolutely, uh, so a super spreader is somebody whose cells are able to make more, more of the virus than others. It's again, like all parts of ourselves, uh, with, with this huge variability in the human race. Um, some of us are, make a very good immune response to viruses and uh, to some viruses and some of us make less. Exactly the same with our ability to support viral replication. Some of us make loads and loads and loads of viruses. And so that would be a super spreader, but they aren't necessarily made sick by the infection. So you have this combination of somebody who isn't made sick by the, uh, by the infection, but makes lots and lots of viruses. So absolutely, if we could identify those people, um, it would be very helpful. You, you also, your questions, your audience's question also address another thing, this thing about um, a symptomless infection. Um, we also know, and this is part of a research study that um, I, I'm actually involved with up in, uh, in St. James's, is um, looking for the people who are resistant to viral infection, who, who just, um, whose innate immune system is so powerful that it gets rid of the infection before ever they make antibodies or T-cells. We don't know what proportion of the population is resistant to the infection. This is another very important piece of information that we need to get. Thanks, mate. I thoroughly enjoyed the chat and I might invite Peter back in and we'll get onto some of the other questions that have come in. But it's been really enjoyable listening to you and chatting. And Peter, I'll hand over to you and you might have supplementally want to ask. Cleana? Uh, no, I, th that was that was great. And we covered a huge amount of ground. And thank you very much, Cleana. Um, so I think we'll broaden the conversation out now. I'm going to introduce uh, Nora Owen. She, Nora doesn't need a huge amount of introduction. She's an extremely well-known uh, face and voice in Irish political life and in Irish broadcasting, former Minister of Justice and very well known indeed. So that's all I'm going to say about her. And I'm just going to bring her in. And Nora, I'm particularly interested to know, we had a lot of questions come in about the role of government and you know, maybe wanting us to criticize government, but I'm much more interested in looking forward here. And a lot of the questions are about that. What are the real lessons that the people in authority need to learn having dealt with this pandemic? And how can they use those to help us now as we come out of this lockdown and as we look forward? Good afternoon, Peter, and thank you very much for that introduction. And can I just first say how lucky we are as a country to have such wonderful experts as we've just heard already. Uh, and, and I'm glad there are people with that kind of uh, huge skill. The whole scientific world has become, uh, they've become the celebrities now in our lives and we're all listening to what they have to say. Um, we have learned a lot in a whole lot of ways in the last year and a half with this pandemic. And I would hope that government will take on board some of the lessons we learned. And I think I have to start because of my background, having minded my husband with dementia for many years and then eventually having to make the decision two years ago that he would go into a nursing home. Um, what has emerged is um, a gap in policy with regard to uh, care of the older people who need more than just the everyday care that we give each other. Uh, and that is either care, personal care in the home or care in a nursing home. And it has shown up the gaps that are there, like the HSE run nursing homes. Then there's a whole lot of private nursing homes. Some are better than others. HICWA does an inspection of a nursing home, but we're now discovering that made, they haven't been followed through. So I hope that this pandemic experience will allow the government to take more interest 
in this side of policy. I've never heard people talk so much about grandmothers and grandfathers and grandchildren. We've suddenly become the people that people are worried about and concerned about. So let's use that new awareness to make sure that we are making life uh, better for people as they age. One of the things that helped me considerably as, as uh, Brian's dementia uh, uh, increased was uh, pre-planning, getting myself ready for the fact that he wouldn't be able to make decisions for himself. And if I wanted to give anybody advice, I would say, please try and take uh, time to do things like sort out your wills, do a power of attorney if you if you are able to do that, if the dementia hasn't gone too far. Make sure that your name is on a household bill so that when you want to ring up the ESB or the gas company, it's not the person with dementia who's on the bill, that you're on the bill as well. Make sure that you have decided, you know, decisions. I know they're tough decisions to make where you would like, you know, how you would deal with funeral, how would you how would you deal with burial or cremation? These are difficult decisions for people to talk about, but it's much better to talk about them when you're still in the full of your health uh, and you can actually sometimes have a bit of fun talking about them. So that would be the kind of pre-planning uh, I do. And I'd like to see the government, there's a, a piece of legislation called the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Legislation. It was passed five years ago and it's still not fully implemented. This will allow the wards of court system to be changed and will allow people with some capacity to make their own decisions and not be dependent on somebody else to do it. And remember that there are a lot of people who are living in their homes, as Roseanne said, alone. They need to be helped to find somebody who is going to help them to make some of these decisions and to uh, link with them. And if I could just finally say, Peter, um, Let's look at why, why is it that we are all worried about the number of people that can go to funerals? We, we as an Irish people like to attend a funeral to show our solidarity, but it's also a companionship as well. So you go to a funeral, you talk to all the other people who are there, you reminisce about the person who has died and you give solidarity and support to the people who are grieving a death. And I often think that we don't fully recognise how hard that has been for the last year or year and a half as people died with the COVID. So I hope that the government, as quickly as possible, can restore attendance in churches, restore, restore attendance at funerals uh, in a safe way so that that part of companionship and solidarity can be restored. Um, Nora, thanks very much. Some sage advice there, not only for government, but also for us as, as individuals. So um, thanks very much. I want to bring in now uh, Mary Louise O'Donnell, a uh, broadcaster, writer um, for the last <laughs> 10 years until 2020 as senator. And again, Mary Louise, I want to ask a, a very similar question. I mean, you know, you've seen an awful lot of how government works from the inside, how it interfaces with the media on both sides of that relationship. I mean, what are the major lessons you learn about how the authorities can help us through this next phase of emerging from this lockdown and hopefully getting some benefits going forward from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, I'd like to echo many of the things that Nora has said there about our great scientific, medical and research, brilliant women that we're coming to know on the television and the radio and all the extraordinary people that have um, become household names and, gui and are guiding us through this appalling COVID I suppose one of the things that you do all the time is you bring your own pathology to your situation. And I never thought I'd be 68. And I never thought that I would be talking about getting older and maybe watching my parent who is 98, who is now in residential care and who had been in care in the home and learning all about what happens to people when they get older in Ireland and they need help either in their homes or either in residential care. And COVID has brought a lot of ghosts to our door. And there are ghosts that we all know about. We all knew those ghosts were there, but we kind of ignored them. But they've come home now. And there are huge lessons from, if you want to call it, the chaos of COVID that has been, manners have been put on by science 
and that we, as people living in this country, must begin to put manners on it politically, as well as what Roseanne said from a social point of view. It seems to me that we keep on making the mistakes of closing down communities. For example, you know, we close down our post offices, we close down our small businesses, we close down our banks, we close down our community centers. And there's a kind of a need. Now, there's some moves to regenerate rural Ireland and to regenerate our towns and our locales and our regions with bringing young people who cannot even afford to live in their own country now, even though they might have permanent jobs, to try to marry that back. But if you're going to learn from COVID, I think that one of the things that, that's dear to me, because you have to go back to what you know, like Nora would go back to her whole years of politics and her whole years as minister. If I go back to what I know, one of the things we could do is the whole area of arts development in Ireland. We have hundreds and thousands of young artists, musicians, singers, dancers, poets, playwrights who are crying out for work and who are looking for a minimum wage, rightfully so. Now, there has to be a coordination between every single one of those, whether they're 18 years of age or whether they're eight years of age and our elders. And there has to be some kind of coordination, as I say, between the Department of, of Education, the Department of Arts, and the Department of Health. We constantly keep talking about our, our older generation in relation to the Department of Health. But as Rose Ann was pointing out, it is so wide of the mark when it comes to staying healthy and staying alive and staying connected and staying valued. And the whole area of the arts in Ireland is there for the taking. And people are, as I say, you know, hungry to perform, hungry to be around. For example, our 400 um, residential nursing homes, there should be arts alive in those on a weekly basis, not on an ad hoc basis. It should be as necessary as physiotherapy. And that's one thing we could do. I mean, and we should also, the government should appoint the care commission and the government put Nora Owen on it. And the government should appoint a person in each department to actually herald the lessons we have learned through community, through social welfare, through uh, arts, through education, through agriculture, all the lessons we have learned so that the, uh, the older, our older generation are front and center to what's, what our future should be. That's the only way it's going to happen. Um, so th that's, that's really where I would start. I, um, I mean, you, have, you can ask questions too about why aren't our older community on television and radio? Why aren't they in presentation positions? Why aren't they in writing positions? Why aren't we listening to them? What's wrong with their experience? Why is everything in modern and new the best way to go? No, it's not. Why aren't we listening to them? Why will we not listen to our, to our, our older generation? Because they will give us the answers because they have the experience. So that's, that's what I would do, a person in each department and a complete amalgamation between the arts and education and um, the Department of Health, absolutely. Um, thanks very much. It, it's safe to say as I get older, the more and more I begin to think experience is a great thing. Um, I'm going to throw over to Damon now, who's going to introduce our next panel. Thanks, Amanda. It's a fa uh, Peter, it's a fascinating discussion. And Marie-Louise, just to pick up on something you said, that the IGS if last year actually specifically lobbied for uh, a minister for older person services to be appointed as a full minister uh, within the government yes. to start that overarching right across the, uh, the, the, the government uh, departments. So I mean, it's a really interesting point to hear you say that. And I think the issue of the lessons that we've learned, I think in Ireland too often we look back and criticise and blame. And you're making the point that we should be looking forward. And Peter said that his introduction be positive and putting the lessons into practice and learning. So thanks for that contribution. Yeah. Could I, could I, could I just make a suggestion? It wouldn't necessarily have to be government. But you could bring a people together to do it anyway. They don't necessarily have to be from government. We have no, to wait and that leads nicely. Yeah. Like there are brilliant people out there in the community who are told they can't work after 65. Now, what is all that about? You know, I mean, I understand that on public service, but there is a whole plethora of people out there eking to get out of work in a way, be it voluntary or otherwise. Yeah. So, so I think that would be music to the ears of Catherine McGuigan, who has waited patiently for uh, her, her, her uh, 
turn. And uh, Catherine, whose bio is up on our website, leads the National Age Friendly Programme and is a real champion of community and home services. And I have to say, Catherine, as you've listened to that discussion, there may be something, we've had loads of questions in. Um, I'll give you a few of them and you can parse from us what you want. Um, but we've had a number of people saying, and it's echoing what some of our panelists have said, and Nora eloquently said this, that listening to the voice of the older person has been an issue during this pandemic. It's been absent from many of the coordinating groups. So I guess I'd ask you, and it's come in from a number of uh, people on the uh, on, on the uh, web, webinar this afternoon, what's in place uh, around the country from uh, a point of view of getting supports in place to help older people getting back to life as we knew it, or life as it will be? And over to you, Catherine. Okay. Thank you for joining us. That's great, Jeremy. Thank you. And yeah, I was listening avidly to, to Moira, who I met down at Wicklow when they were having our Older People's Convention and also had the, the luxury of working for seven years with Nora Owen in the Fingal Age Friendly Programme and one of our biggest champions. So I think I'll sort of take it in, in three stages and particularly responding to the issues that um, Moira raised. So in the first instance, as you know, Jeremy, Age Friendly Ireland are hosted in the local government sector, but would straddle a number of age or uh, I suppose departments and would have representation so what we do is is we're almost like a conduit and a catalyst of the authentic voice of older people so across the the local authority sector in the 31 local authorities we have 31 older people's councils who are a representative body of diverse older people and not just an homogenous group from one particular part of a particular county they're a very very diverse representation so through the pandemic we had the luxury of being able to do a lot of consultation and one of the first things that came to light was the fact that they were transitioning from that human contact you know physical settings of meetings and having to come online and there was lots of supports put in place i mean the community call helplines were put in in all the 31 local authorities um to date they've received about 65,000 calls there's about 11,000 of them have been particularly around social isolation that Roseanne was speaking to, but for a number of other practical supports. And then through ourselves, there was a number of different, um, I suppose, issues raised for us that we could take to government, even very, very practical things like the test, the test for the driver's license. We were able to go to that particular department and get that extended because they were coming from real people and real practical barriers that they were experiencing. And what we really needed to do was put in digital ambassador programs, peer-to-peer -peer support programs, the newsletter, because not everybody had the digital literacy and wanted to get a hard copy of information. We did a daily newsletter because the, the information was changing every day. And we wanted to make sure that we were giving people evidence-based public health advice in a format that was conducive to them, whether it was printed out, whether it was over the telephone, whatever the case may be. So there was thousands and thousands, I suppose, of support delivered. But what the most important thing is going back to, what are the lessons that we've learned? So Myra, you were talking, for example, about the creative arts so and the residential care homes. So one of the things that we have done with Creative Ireland is COVID concerts, as they as called, um, have been delivered, where you're getting creating employment opportunities for artists at local level, and they're going out and delivering concerts to the, to the residential care homes in the gardens using the gazebo. And it's one of the most beautiful initiatives I've ever seen because the older people have this opportunity for this interaction and an interaction with the music. And there's something that I think should be sustained. But it's also harnessing on the fact that we've done these lovely intergenerational videos between, um, albeit that they're online, but some of the older people are telling the young people about their experience of the vaccine. But they're also saying we miss people. We miss holding people or hugging people you know and the digital is there and it'll go some way but we do want to get back in and again we would have a range of mix in terms of older people some can't wait to get back outside and some are quite fearful so in doing that we're rolling out the age-friendly business program to ensure that businesses and that have adopted certain actions that will make older people comfortable and including that transport and non-COVID related transport where people can feel that they can get to where they want to go to. But equally, if you look at Roseanne's point about the built environment and the age-friendly park and it needs to be put in place, and the NDA have just recently announced about 200 uh, million in capital funding for cycleways and public walkways that are accessible and age friendly so that we can encourage that and foster that in the environment. Then you jump to like Nora's point, what have we learned in terms of 
community care and that the urgency is now we had the housing options for our aging population so that our traditional culture in this country around transitioning into residential care when you come to the end of time in your own home and it's no longer meet for your needs through that policy lots and lots of interventions have been adopted like housing adaptations or right sizing policies but that has been fast tracked now by the pandemic and will probably accelerate it. And in that regard, we're doing a, a very good program around healthy age friendly homes where we will support people and facilitate people through that process so that they will be afforded every opportunity to do their home, adopt their home, stay in their home, right size to better accommodation in their home in close proximity to their own services before they have to transition into residential care. And residential care is fine if it's timely. The travesty is if somebody's going then in there prematurely when there are no other options afforded to them. And with a robust package of care like home help, meals on wheels, supports in the community and their house, they can actively live in their own and that's what they want to do. But again, that's looking at the planning authority and making sure that we're making use of brownfield sites that are in close proximity to services, close to neighbourhoods and communities. And the rural's future policy that has just come out speaks to that. Even the remote working strategies that are going to come, that people are no longer commuting two and three hours in the morning and can maybe use hubs. And that will bring some vibrancy back into rural areas and people will buy lunches and do their shopping at home as opposed to work in another county. So there's a lot of potential in that. I think for me, really, Jim, what we've tried to make sure is that it's the authentic voice of older people that's coming through. We are listening to older people. In 11 years, we've consulted with 25,000 older people um, directly, whether it's in through local strategy development, roundtable consultations, uh, focus groups. We're also trying to make sure that we have all different types of voices coming in and that it's not just, as I say, one singular voice. But what we do is we implement the actions. We try to get change, but we escalate that voice up and try to get that. And that's, I suppose, if there's one thing that I will continue to do through Age Friendly Ireland is make sure that older people are being given the opportunity to co-design the solutions with government that will ultimately shape the future post-pandemic. So um, I suppose that's as brief a synopsis as I can do, uh, Peter and Jeremy. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. And I guess, Peter, there's a couple of people, there's a lot of questions coming in. It's just going to be very difficult to get through them all. But, Peter, when I was doing a bit of a background check on you, I came across a famous cricketer in uh, in, in England uh, who, who's Peter Lodge. So it's obviously wasn't you, but it, you, you're very much interested in the how people negotiate trade-offs uh, is one of the areas that you work in. And this might be something that Cleana, Peter, and others might um, think of answering. So... How do we restructure society to enhance social engagement in a broader sense, but specifically, and Kleena, you know, when Peter's had a stab at this, when can people, when can people who are vaccinated meet outside, or indeed, when can anyone meet outside, and would that be part of a restructure that we would see? So I guess, Peter, to you, first of all, you know, a man in his 80s in the west of Ireland said he'd been vaccinated, he was wondering and worried about going out there. Can he travel by bus and train? Can he go around the country to visit and stay with family? Mm -hmm. From a social engagement and from a from a, communi a science of community point of view, would you have any comment on that? And then we'll throw it over to the panel. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, as, as a very quick aside, I will make the confession, the cricketer was actually me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, really? Yeah, I, yeah, it was. <laughs> I, I, I do study trade-offs. You're absolutely right. And I think there's a particularly difficult trade-off for older people. And I hear them talk about it all the time in our community at the moment and the many older relatives that I have, which is, I mean, they know that how important social connectedness is to them. And I think Roseanne's science surprises me by how strong that effect is. And I think it would probably surprise them. But they do know it's really important. And they're itching to see friends and grandchildren and get back out there. But they're also frightened. And quite rightly so, because this virus is vicious. And we know that. So they're in a trade-off. And you're right, I do study trade-offs. And one of the things I, I know about them as a behavioral scientist is that most trade-offs, you have to jump one way or the other. You simply have to make a decision on which way you're going to go. But this is one that actually develops over time. And there's nothing wrong with dipping your toe back in the water slowly in these circumstances and going in the right direction. You know, engaging in social activity gradually more and more until you begin to feel more comfortable with it, watching the norms of what others around are doing and following the advice, just listening to the public health advice about how prevalent the disease is, what the latest advice is and trying to follow it. So it's not as if one has to immediately jump and say, look, am I going to get back into the social activity now I have the chance or now I've been vaccinated or not? There is the opportunity to learn by doing and establish new habits and new patterns of social activity. 
Um, if I may, just as co-chair as well as we're opening up, I really want to get back to Roseanne Kenny because I'm really interested in the science policy interface. You'd expect that. I work at the SRI and I'm a scientist who puts evidence into the policy space. I mean, Roseanne, you've heard a load of ideas about promoting community and social connectedness. How do they tally with the science that you started us off with? I mean, do, are there any you would pick out as being particularly stronger ideas or are there any you'd like to add? Um, I, 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 I mean, we, we've touched on a, no, a whole lot of areas. One a sort of high level approach I would take to what maybe Nora and, and Mary Louise was saying is that the Denmark model of uh, aging in place is something that we should focus on in Ireland going forward. They have, they have a population of 5.5 million and they, they, only, they have 10% of our nursing home patients are in nursing homes and even then their nursing home is a five bedded apartment with a central nursing hub. So let's think about aging in place. There are always a proportion of people who need to go into nursing homes. There's no question about that, but it's significantly less than, than we're currently uh, using at the moment. Um, and the second thing I, I think is that when we're reopening Ireland, we need to think of how we reopen and, 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 and enable engagement and not a blunt instrument and as, as has happened today with respect to funerals and churches, these are social gatherings that are really important to, to groups within our community. So that I would, I would say to actually look at things in a much more specific way um, rather, than, rather than generalizing, you know, outdoor sports, et cetera. You know, let, use our common sense and be more cohort specific in our approach when we're reopening. Mm -hmm. Very good. Dermot? Nora, Dermot? You, you obviously yes, want to Nora. get in. And, yes, and, I, Nora, just I, I, I'd like very, very, yes. very briefly, Nora, can I just ask a quick question? Say whatever you're going to say, but please answer one other thing for me as well. Because yes. you've got great experience in government. And what I really pick up from listening to an awful lot of this is how difficult it is to get policy coordinated across the different That's departments correct. and agencies that they're dealing with. And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Well, yes, this term whole of government has become more commonplace nowadays. And what it means is, as Mary Louise was pointing out, it requires much more interface from one government department to the other. We set up government departments and we silo information and silo policies and we need to open that up. And I... The, the main area that that can be done is through the Taoiseach's office. The Taoiseach doesn't have a particular portfolio, any Taoiseach, I'm not being specific. And so the Taoiseach's department needs, in my view, to be having much more of a watching brief across the other departments where pet policies are are not are causing tension from one place to another and you make an announcement about some uh, economic policy and you find that's disenfranchising another whole group of people the housing that that's been mentioned here i'd like to see the department of environment local government and housing looking at the uh, talking to the developers and saying if you agree in your housing development to make a little cluster of houses with the built-in uh, room where people can meet for their lunch, where they can get their medical attention, but they can rent in that little space, they should be getting special help to do that. Most builders are just not interested. We had a committee going where I live here in Malahide a few years ago. We couldn't really get that movement going. There are people in big houses with empty rooms not able to keep them and should be able to right size as they call it away from the four bedroomed house into a two bedroomed or another unit but still get some care around it and i'd like to see the Taoiseach and the department of the Taoiseach looking at the different policies around the other departments to get them i also quickly want to mention the whole benefit of choirs. I can't let this meeting go without mentioning the choir I'm in, the Forget-Me-Nots, which is a dementia-friendly choir. Those are areas that people get great social interaction and they're brought maybe by their carer to the choir, but during the day and during the choir, they're mixing with people, chatting uh, at whatever level of chat they can take. They're laughing, they're enjoying it, they're having a cup of tea. And so that whole area, and I heard this morning David Brophy talking about he's going to start a choir now for healthcare, people in the healthcare work, working environment. And that'll be give them a chance to resurrect themselves after the pandemic. Because remember, we, the people who are not in these areas, are so beholden to the people who have been in our health services 
and to the people in our supermarkets and our shops that have kept us all going. Can, can I can I just say, um, in relation to what Laura was saying, in relation to the coordination of departments, is it all right to speak? Yes, coordination yeah. of departments. I wrote a, um, a, a report for government about dying, death and bereavement in Ireland. And everybody thought, with great help from Roseanne Penny, um, but I, I, everybody thought it was going to be about health. But, but it wasn't. It was about the way we live, you know, live well until we have to leave the planet, you know, until we have to leave the island for good. It was about social welfare. It was about education. It was about arts. It was about community. It was about agriculture. It was about a thousand trying to get the departments to see that they had a part to play in this, that it just wasn't about health and the coroner. And it's the same thing when it comes to what we're talking here about social life, social cohesion. All government departments are involved. And as Nora said to the Department of the T-shirt, that could be a fund, you know, to actually create um, a widespread kind of way forward. There's also, I mean, I, when I was listening to Catherine McGuigan there, there's a, loads and loads of organisations who work so hard, but sometimes they probably feel that their work that the work gets kind of dissipated because again it's not coordinated in and they're they're running between four different departments as opposed to one coordination. If you look also at the Belt Beltana Festival this year, I mean that is a festival specifically set up for elders in relation to the arts. But it we are it kind of you know, striving on a daily basis to get recognised and to get coordinated from all the different other departments. So you, it's really just social cohesion means what it, what, it, what um, Roseanne was saying, cohesion, bringing together, making decisions that are effective, like a dartboard for all aspects of the dartboard, not just the middle, you know. But I have to say, listening to all of that, and we're just coming up nearly to bang on half four, uh, we've really just started scratching the surface of uh, what we should be doing when we review uh, what's happened in the year gone by. And, uh, you know, there's been floods of questions in and streamed in that we haven't got around to. So we're going to have to long hard think about what we do uh, as a society and uh, as the IGS Public Forum to figure out what we want to do. So what I'd like to do is thank Peter Lunn, uh, and I'm going to hand straight back over. I mean, Roseanne, Shane, Carl of Lumino, Miriam and May and Educate Together, our sponsors have been great, but it's the listenership and the engagement on a panel like this that's been fantastic. So I'd hand over to you to close. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as president of the IGS, I just want to thank everybody for logging on and listening today. We, this is the second of our public lectures. It's a new initiative. The IGS, as Dermot says, is about education and training of healthcare professionals. I, I hate the word elderly. I hate, I actually don't even like older adults. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm saying adults in Ireland. We've nearly 750,000 people over the age of 65 in Ireland. That's a big chunk of our country. I think we need to be listened to much more readily. So I hope that through these platforms, you as the public have an opportunity to share the science with us and to share the initiatives and, and will continue to join us. Thousands of people have registered and more will be able to look at the video later on. I thank you. And on behalf of everybody involved in the organization, particularly May Olden and Miriam Ahern today, thank you all. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our great energized panel. And thank you to you for listening. So slán agus